The miraculous beach, or prize for modesty, a minta. At the first threat, people began to stay off the streets of Rome. Then, after a few days, a, a generalized fear took over, and the city itself began to empty out. Seized with fear, hour after hour, the citizens of Rome stormed the train stations and, shoving their way onto train carriages, had fled far away. The richest people glutted their cars with oil and gas before bolting out of the 13 city gates and, kicking up dust, headed to the most distant cardinal points. And so it was for ten days. And then, suddenly, the train stations were deserted, and throughout Rome it was only the peddlers' carts that raised any dust, the peddlers being afraid of nothing. At that point, no one was left in the metropolis. Only a few heroes and heroines stayed to watch over the city. At midday, the heroes roamed imperiously through the streets, jacketless. They allowed the sun to whip their silk shirts to shreds while vainly regarding their reflections in their belt buckles. When seeing each other on opposite pavements, even without knowing one another, they smiled proudly, confident that from Le Terrano to Monte Mario, from Valle Giulia to St. Paul's, their supremacy would last undisturbed and uncontested for at least two months. The heroines didn't go out in the sun. They each waited inside for their heroes to return home when they would dry their sweat and iron their silk shirts. The women went out only at night, and exercising their wily ways, they would flick flirtatious glances with their stray cat eyes behind their companions' backs. Since I adhere to the laws of nature and love the heat of the sun in summer, the heat of the stove in winter, I was among those heroes who hadn't fled the city during the summer onslaught. The heroine chosen to dry my sweat was called Aminta. Uh, this was once a male name, but my girlfriend's father did not know literary history. And uh, 18 years earlier, trusting his own ear, he had imposed that name on his newborn daughter. The priest who baptized her didn't dare inform the father of his innocent error. Aminta, at the first heat of summer, conceded immediately to the excellent reasons I had used to convince her that we should stay in Rome instead of departing for the, the mountains or, or seaside. And so the first eight days of the heat wave passed easily. On Aminta's pale face, I never once detected the slightest indication of regret, repentance, disrespect, or desire. I was therefore astonished when on the afternoon of the ninth day, having returned from my rounds on the blazing streets, a minter, after a jubilant greeting, approached me where I'd sunk down upon a couch in my study, and placing a hand on my shoulder, said suddenly, darling, you must give me a small present you must have a beautiful bathing suit made for me. I felt my brow furrow. <laughs> my disparaging, masculine soul became muddy with suspicion. I stared at her, grimly. What for, Aminta? <laughs> what has come over you? Aren't we divinely happy in Rome? Uh, are you thinking of leaving? Or perhaps going to the beach? Oh, I have explained to you again and again that... No, 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 she interrupted. Her eyes, her brow, her, her mouth, her whole body laughing. I didn't mean that at all. Yes, we're very happy here in Rome. Who would dream of leaving? I simply want a beautiful bathing suit in order to have a beautiful bathing suit. <laughs> and once you have it, I will put it on. <laughs> when? Every so often. For a little while, every day. And then, and then, after a while, I will take it off. <laughs> That's it? That's it, I swear. She was so transparent. 
All suspicion vanished from my soul. I kept quiet for a minute in order to give greater weight to the words I was about to utter. <laughs> then declared, very well, all is fine. Yes, darling, go ahead and have a beautiful bathing suit made for yourself. She clapped her hands and jumped for joy, then tenderly kissed all of the sweat off my face in gratitude. Over the next few days, she was very busy. As for her research, studies, attempts, doubts, and resolutions regarding the construction of her bathing suit, I wasn't privy to her secrets. She went out a few times during the day and stayed in her room for long hours with a seamstress. She wouldn't allow me to know a thing. She wanted to surprise me with an unexpected masterpiece. Her face was full of happiness, day and night. Preoccupied with my virile thoughts, after a few days, I'd almost forgotten about her feminine pastime. But on Wednesday morning, when I took off my jacket before heading out, Aminta said goodbye, then added, When you return in an hour, it will be ready. What will be ready? Oh, the bathing suit. Really? Yes, hurry back and you'll see. It's absolutely marvellous. When I returned home, less than an hour later, a sliver of suspicion was still trying to insidiously act upon me. Was it possible that this little story concerning the bathing suit marked the start of a campaign to get me to take her to the seaside? I went into my study where I, I heard her voice coming from the other side of the door to her room. Don't come in. I'm ready. Sit down on the couch. Okay, I won't come in. Okay, I'm sitting on the couch. I stared at the door to her room. When it opened, a great light entered the study, and at the center of that light, Aminta stood wearing her bathing suit. My heart skipped a beat. Aminta came towards me. She seemed to be lit up, propelled by all the light in the sky. Trembling in ecstasy, I didn't move from where I was. Aminta stopped in the middle of the room. It was truly marvelous. Pale rose silk draped down from her throat, accentuating her breasts, then gathered around her hips in a band of tiny pleats flaring into a short skirt that didn't dare graze her flesh, the undulating hem quivering suggestively. <laughs> Layered on top of the minuscule skirt's pink material was a flounce of acute triangles, their color emerald green. A minter stood in the middle of the room, in the light cascading from her eyes, the pale rose of the silk bathing suit changed from minute to minute into a thousand mother-of-pearl reflections. The green of the flounce suggested a swarm of shiny scarab beetles flying across a sunset. And amidst that effusion of tender colors, the white of her arms and legs became even paler. On her feet, she wore two small green satin slippers. A minter was laughing with all of her soft flesh, with her entire green and pale rose bathing suit. She laughed and shook like a plant in a garden. And the room was filled with the scent of paradise. I didn't have the courage to move. Aminta was happy to be alive. Her laugh, sounding like uh, silver bells flying out the window and rushing up to heaven. Aminta sat herself down on the carpet in the middle of the room, her arms behind her and her white legs crossed, her torso reclining backwards and stretched out as if she were offering herself up to God. Her gaze landed on me. I still hadn't moved, and I 
held my heart in my hands. At the sight of my emotion, she was touched with affection and gratitude. Still trembling, I approached her. I sat beside her on the carpet and gently took her hand. I caressed her whole body with my eyes. Then I timidly touched the pale rose silk of her bathing suit with my forehead. Aminta's eyes, full of smiles, were swelling with tears of affection. They contained a message for me. In a trembling voice, she said, You see how beautiful it is, with no need to go to the seaside. I felt the entirety of her innocent soul pressing against me. I was overcome by love. And I, too, now searched for something simple to say to her. With my cheek resting on her cool arm, I whispered, Your modest desires deserve a prize. She softened and once again laughed joyfully. But when I didn't join in, she stopped laughing and looked at me expectantly. Something fluttered in the air and touched me. I saw that she also had felt something. Her shoulders instantly trembled and she said, what is it? How beautiful. The whole room filled with a kind of light breath which then immediately disappeared. All around me I saw a flickering light. This too passed before my and Aminta's eyes then fled away. Oh, how fabulous this is, Aminta murmured. She was sitting at the edge of the carpet and I was further back, almost behind her. A strange, sweet, murmuring sound reached us, fading at her feet. I saw that she was listening intently. The ground murmured again, while before our eyes, everything in the room vanished into a light mist infiltrated by blue shadows and silver flashes. By now, the murmuring coming from the ground had become regular and frequent. It originated far away, swished nearby, and died down at her feet. The murmuring then became prolonged. One coming close seemed to expand. Suddenly, she let out a cry and drew back her feet. Look, look, she cried. I looked. Her green slipper was wet, as was her foot, up to her ankle. And again, again, the gushing increased. The sound of tiny waves arriving at the edge of the carpet continued, pushing at her feet and alongside her legs. Fearlessly, she leaned forward, plunged her hands into those waves, then lifted them out, dripping with water. The sea! The sea! The silver and blue mist around us filled with light, and the carpet burned like sand. A minter dived in, outstretched, her breasts extending over the edge. Then she came back up, the wet silk clinging to her chest, her nipples erect. I stared at her, ecstatic, and listened to the sea which had come to visit us. Suddenly, a bigger wave reached me, and I felt the water rising as far as my calves. I jumped to my feet, alarmed. Uh, Aminta, I'd better go and put on my bathing suit, too. <laughs> yes, she cried. There's one in the bottom drawer of your bureau, but hurry. And both of us were very happy. Oh.